Today's video is another compilation of some of the worst mountaineering tragedies we have covered on this channel. From North America's worst disaster, to a British school expedition, to Russia's most controversial climb. We cover it all. I appreciate you all for taking the time to watch my marathon videos. But if you want to see new stories when they get posted, just hit the subscribe button. And remember, viewer discretion is advised. On November 22, 1971, Bill Campbell, a navigator with the search and rescue helicopter flight covering the Cairngorm region in the Scottish Highlands, was a part of a small crew that was tasked with flying into a blizzard. The outside temperature gauge was indicating negative 10 degrees Celsius, or 14 degrees Fahrenheit. The small crew's eyes scanned the vast white landscape, looking for any color amongst the plain white. But there was nothing but strong winds and heavy snowfall. They had to reduce the speed of the helicopter due to the intense turbulence and flew at about 40 knots or 46 miles per hour. The group was exhausted as they had been up all night and been preparing for this rescue since 1.30 a.m. after they had found out that a group of eight, including six teens, had been missing somewhere in the vast landscape, fighting against a blizzard for their lives. Over 50 individuals were looking for the group using any methods they could, but so far, nobody had made any progress. As the men flew through the storm on instruments alone, Bill would hear from a fellow member, contact 10 o'clock. John Kennedy, the pilot, would immediately make a right turn into the wind, and the men would see what they all thought was a red tint in the distance. But as they flew closer, the tent suddenly sprouted arms and began to wave. It was a girl, and she was crawling through waist-deep snow, hardly able to move her body. But when they finally did reach her, she could only utter three words. Fay Boudet buried burn. The men did not know it at the time, but their discovery would change mountaineering forever. And as they learned of the events that had occurred over the previous two days, many lives would be changed. This is their story. Before we dive into today's video, I wanted to put a disclaimer as this tragedy covers serious and real events that happen to teenagers. Viewer discretion is advised. The Cairngorms are a mountainous region of Scotland that was established as a national park in September of 2003. The central area is a remote high granite plateau at about 1,200 meters, consisting of many long glacial valleys running north to south. Between two valleys, the plateau extends to the summit of the two most famous peaks in the area, the namesake of the region, Cairngorm Mountain, which overlooks Aviemore, the main town in the area, and on the other side, at 1,309 meters, Ben Macdui, the tallest mountain of the region and the second highest peak in all the British Isles. The edges of the plateau are steep cliffs of granite that many tourists and avid outdoorsmen ski, rock, and ice climb. To this day, the area remains very remote, with few roads or trails expanding through the vast landscape. This has attracted people who want to explore its beauty, but there are risks, and in 1971, they were magnified compared to today. The main concern with the area is the weather conditions, or the unpredictability of the weather. The height, distance, and severe climate create a serious challenge to plan any long-term expedition. Snow can fall at any time during the year and snow patches persist in the area all summer. In fact, it is so cold that the area is technically a subarctic climate, which simply means there are long, cold winters and short, cool summers. The climate is more similar to the high ground in the Arctic regions of Canada or Norway than the European Alps. But we have cold climates all over our planet. That doesn't necessarily make a region dangerous. What is different on the Cairngorm Plateau is the severity at which the weather can change. The weather often deteriorates rapidly with elevation. So even when there are moderate conditions below the plateau, 150 meters higher on the top, the weather is vastly different. 
Storms and mist rage around anyone braving to take on the climate. You are stepping on ice patches and powdery snow is falling all around you, making it difficult to see. Even when no snow is falling, the wind can whip up the powder on the ground to produce whiteout conditions for a few meters above the surface, and snow drifts can build up rapidly in sheltered places. Gravel can be blown through the air, making walking nearly impossible. The barren wasteland has such an extreme climate that a record wind speed of 173 miles per hour was measured at the summit weather station. For reference, this would equate to a category 5 hurricane or an EF4 to 5 tornado. For both of those natural events, that is the most dangerous and violent rating of their category. Even people who have traveled the Antarctic and climbed the Himalayas have said that the Cairngorm Plateau can be as dangerous as some of the most extreme parts of the world. The locals have spent generations adapting to the sudden weather changes and trying to find ways to cope. Across the area you can find small stone buildings originally built for farm workers called Abathi. Nowadays, they mainly provide shelter for anybody who is walking the highlands and may need to escape the severe weather. Some of these buildings have basic equipment and an area to make a fire, but some are simply stone that is designed to protect you from the harsh conditions outside. Although there are several of these buildings spread throughout the Cairngorm Plateau, one of the highest is known as the Kuranbathi. Although it does have a chimney for a fire, it is a tiny building standing at 4 meters by 2 meters, and this shelter is often used as a last resort by anyone crossing the plateau. The Cairngorm Plateau expedition would be made up of 14 teenagers and two adults from a large secondary school in Edinburgh called Ainsley Park. The expedition would be spearheaded by Ainsley Park's 23-year-old outdoor education teacher, Ben Beatty. Catherine Murray Brown, a six-year student at the school in 1971, would state the following when talking about Ben. He was a popular teacher. He was very gregarious and very outgoing, and up until that point had never done anything particularly controversial. Catherine would also state it wasn't an unusual thing for the school to partake in outdoor education trips, and there was just this idea that people went off on something that was meant to be great fun and really enjoyable and really good. Although Ben had taken students almost every Friday to camp, walk, and explore the wilderness, in November of 1971, he wanted to do something more ambitious. Ben had a lot of experience in the mountains, but he had never hiked the Cairngorm Plateau in winter, and he would need a partner who knew their way around the environment, so he enlisted the help of his 20-year-old girlfriend, Catherine Davis. Catherine, otherwise known as Kathy, was a student at Doomfordline College of Education and she had been walking the hills since she was 14 and began climbing in the area at 16. She also had advanced qualifications from the Scottish Mountaineering Club and had completed three winter hikes over the plateau, making her the ideal person to help Ben. After Ben suggested it to the school, everyone thought it was a great idea and soon they had the approval. The plan was for the two adults to take a group of 14 students from Ainsley Park's Mountaineering Club to Langlia, the town's new outdoor center near the city of Avamore. There, they would meet up with the final adult of the expedition, an 18-year-old who was a temporary member of the Langlia staff named Sheila Sunderland. In the weeks leading up to the expedition, the school would make emergency rescue officials aware of what was to take place. Additionally, the school would send home permission slips with each child that their parents had to sign off on. But these permission slips didn't tell the full story. Many of the parents thought this would be a routine trip to Langlia and a short hike around the building. What they weren't aware of is that this would be a winter expedition through the Cairngorm Plateau. Although the parents weren't fully informed, it was still the school's primary concern to ensure the students had the proper gear and clothes for the expedition. Because they only planned to be gone for two days, each student was equipped with basic supplies for one night. This includes mountaineering items like carabiners, which would help secure ropes, harnesses, and a stove for cooking. They were also given sleeping bags meant for extreme weather, large tarps for emergency shelters, and a basic first aid kit. Additionally, because this was 1971, there was no tracking devices or satellite phones like today, meaning the only way anyone knew if there was an issue was when a group would fail to reach their rendezvous point. 
The group underwent significant training in the weeks leading up to the expedition. Ben taught the 14 teenagers a series of mountaineering techniques such as ascending and descending steep slopes, how to climb through rock and ice patches, how to slide down icy slopes safely, and of course, how to self-arrest if they were to fall. This is a technique used to stop yourself from an uncontrollable slide. Finally, each member of the group went through a series of basic comprehensive first aid training that included special attention to cold environments with issues such as frostbite. The students were also shown what to do in an emergency situation, in particular, how to navigate using a compass in conditions such as a whiteout. This training was crucial to the expedition and it plays a pivotal role later in the story. Because of the training leading up to the expedition, it became clear that six members of the group were not as capable as the rest of the party due to the lack of experience with high elevation hikes. Because of this, a plan was put together that would split the teenagers into two groups. The first group would be led by Ben and made up of eight teenagers who had been on different trips with him before. The other six less experienced members would be led by Kathy and Sheila on a more simple route. The plan was for both groups to start at the outdoor center and follow the same route on day one, with the experienced group leading, and the less experienced following close behind. After enjoying a meal together and preparing for the long trip, they would leave the outdoor center and climb up the road to a parking lot. At midday, they would set out from the parking lot before passing through several different areas, including the plateau, and finally reaching the top of Ben Macdui. After reaching the summit, they would descend the peak following a shallow stream all the way to Kor Bothy their shelter for the night. On day two, the inexperienced group would follow the plateau back right away, while the experienced group would head out to climb Britain's third and fourth highest peaks before following the plateau back as well. Around 4.30 p.m. on the 21st, they would all meet up at Rothy Murchis's Bailey's Metal Bridge, near the foot of the Cairn Gorm, where the two groups would ride back to the outdoor center, concluding their expedition. This was plan A, Ben and Kathy had also come up with a plan B because they knew how dangerous the Cairngorms could be. If the weather turned bad, both teams would skip the climb of Ben Macdui, instead heading for the small current shelter at the top of the plateau called Kuran Bathi. Here, they would wait out the bad weather before exiting through the lower pass together. After everyone had been informed of the plan and it was signed off on, Ben and Kathy prepared to take the excited teenagers on their trip. On the morning they were set to depart, they checked the weather forecast and there didn't seem to be anything out of the ordinary for that time of year. But what Ben and Kathy didn't realize was that a cold northwesterly stream of air had been blowing across most of Scotland that week. Many of the high roads were already covered in snow, making it impossible for anyone to get around the area quickly. This had an impact on the group right away, as they couldn't use the road to reach the restaurant at Cairn Gorm, which was supposed to be their starting point. Instead, they would have to take a ski lift to the top, which meant that they would depart on their trek a little later than they had originally planned. Once they did reach the top, they would quickly eat lunch and set off around 1 p.m., over an hour after their original start time. Ben's more experienced group would leave first, and the less experienced group would set out behind them about 20 minutes later. Almost immediately after the two groups had set out, the weather began to turn. A mile into their trek, a blizzard-like wind began blowing around the group, causing snow to be lifted all around them. They were now trying to navigate in a total whiteout. Nobody could see more than a few meters in front of their faces. So they stopped, pulled out a rope, and all of the teenagers attached themselves to Ben and each other. At this point, it became obvious they would have to move to plan B. They would all start making their way towards Kuran Bathi immediately. It was a difficult trip, and the entire time they were fighting against the snow that swirled around them. But after two and a half hours, at 3.30 p.m., they had found the shelter. Once they reached the Bothy, they would have to dig out the entrance as it was completely blocked by the snow, a testament to how bad the weather had become after a few hours. As the group began to warm up inside, the hours passed, and there was no sign of the inexperienced group. Ben would assume that they had found shelter in some other Bothy on the path, or at least that is what he hoped for.
The next morning, the group woke up and began preparing to make the trip back. They dug out their shelter, but the weather showed no signs of improving, so the group knew it was going to be a long day. Normally, they would have stayed within the Bothy and waited out the storm, but remember, they had prepared for a short trip, so they were quickly running out of supplies. It was not possible for the group to go back the way they came through the upper plateau, so instead, they would need to descend into a lower pass. But this came with risks, because they would have to rappel down a steep cliff. One by one, each member would slowly make their way down the cliff, with Ben helping along the way. One of the boys would slip in the cold, and Ben would quickly reach out and grab him, stopping his fall. Thankfully, this was the only incident that took place during their descent. The group would slowly continue their trip back to safety, eventually reaching a hut that had some basic supplies, where Ben would radio the outdoor center and let them know what had occurred. At 5.30 p.m., Ben and his group would reach the bridge they were supposed to rendezvous with Kathy at, but there was a problem. They weren't there. Ben would quickly check the restaurant and the outdoor center, but there was still no sign of her group. This was a problem, because Kathy's group had set out behind Ben's, and they should have certainly made it back before his. This meant that something was wrong, and Ben would quickly notify rescue officials at this point. On the previous day after Ben's group had set out on their trek, Kathy waited 20 minutes before her group of inexperienced climbers would set out following in the previous group's footsteps. Sometime later, Kathy's group were spotted from the base plateau, heading directly towards the storm clouds. As the blizzard hit, the group made the decision to descend lower into the valley in an attempt to get away from the whiteout conditions. But it didn't work. They would push forward, looking for the Quran Bafi, but instead would find the lake that was near their shelter. By the time they found the lake, the snow and wind were more intense than it had ever been. This meant the water was frozen and completely covered, making it difficult to recognize specifically where the group was. Kathy knew that the shelter was out there, and it had to be close, but she had no idea how to find it. She was out of options. In a last ditch effort, Kathy would instruct her group to bivouac at their current location in an attempt to escape the conditions. What Kathy didn't know was that they couldn't have picked a worse spot to set up camp. They were at a place called Fay Boudet, and it was a natural trap for drifting snow. This also meant they were just a few hundred feet away from the Kuran Bathi. The group would initially try to build a shelter out of the snow but it was too powdery to make anything stable. So instead, they tried to build a snow wall to protect them from the wind. By the time this was complete, most of their clothes were soaked. Because of this, the teenagers would take off their wet clothes and huddle in their sleeping bags together as the snow continued to fall on them. Initially, this helped, and they tried to keep morale high by telling jokes and singing, but the weather was not stopping anytime soon. Soon, some of the teenagers began panicking and screaming at Kathy for help. The snow was falling as quickly as they could shake it off and filling their mouths. Some thought they were choking as their sleeping bags rapidly covered with snow. As darkness came, Kathy spent most of the night attempting to dig the children out of the snow. She would kick the snow off over and over until it became so thick that she began using her bare hands. Eventually, she would lose her gloves as she frantically tried to keep the teenagers' heads above the surface. She tried as best she could, but the snow didn't stop, and night only made it worse. When morning came on the 21st, Kathy could hear shouting from one of the boys who was buried beneath the snow. By the time she dug him out, another student had already become half buried. The other adult in the group, Sheila, and another girl were in bad shape as they were both in a daze and in the final stages of hypothermia. In severe cases of hypothermia, your body actually feels very warm, almost like a burning sensation. This is why many people who suffer severe hypothermia begin taking off their clothes thinking they are hot, when in reality, this is a death sentence. Kathy was horrified to find that two girls had taken off their clothes and were outside of their sleeping bags on top of the snow. Another student, William, would help Kathy get the girls back into the sleeping bags, but this was the final straw. The camp was in chaos, 
and Kathy decided that she had to get help or everyone was going to die. Kathy and the strongest member of the group, William, would set off into the storm, but almost immediately have to turn back around because of the strong wind. There was nothing they could do but continue to huddle in their sleeping bags and try to protect themselves from the cold. The following morning, almost everyone in the group had been covered by the falling snow. Kathy could hear voices shouting from below her in the snow, but as time went on, the voices got quieter and quieter. Kathy and William would set off again, but almost immediately, William would collapse from exhaustion. Kathy, in a move of complete desperation, would resort to crawling on her hands and knees through the waist-deep snow. Sergeant John Duffy was visiting friends when he got the call at midnight that there were missing hikers on the Cairngorm Plateau. As leader of the mountain rescue team, this isn't uncommon, but what made this call different was that it was six teenagers and two adults. By 3 a.m., the rescue team's snow track vehicle was on its way up the valley towards Korobathi, which was the intended location for the group to seek shelter. But it was empty, which John knew meant that the group had spent two nights outdoors in sub-zero temperatures. The following day, on Monday, November 22nd, a search party of over 50 individuals, including police mountain rescue teams and helicopters, was underway. One of these helicopters was carrying navigator Bill Campbell, and Bill and his fellow rescue operators had been awake all night, covering a game plan for the search. But the weather had made it very difficult. They had spent hours checking all the Bothies in the area, but to this point, they had found nothing. It wasn't until 9.30 a.m. that one of the crew members spotted a bright red tent, or what they thought was a tent. But as the helicopter got closer, the tent would raise its arms, and they realized it was Kathy, who had been crawling on her hands and knees. The rescue helicopter had trouble getting close to Kathy because each time it got close to the ground, the rotors would spit up the white snow, causing a whiteout, making it impossible to see anything. They tried three separate times to land, but couldn't. And knowing there was a cloud storm coming their way, the helicopter would drop two rescue officials about 70 yards away from Kathy in an area that wasn't covered in deep snow. After the two men reached her, they realized she was utterly exhausted. She was in a state of total collapse, and it was practically impossible to drag her through the waist deep snow. Because the helicopter could not get close to the group, they were left with one option. Bill would drop out of the hatch with the helicopter winch in tow, and use it to help guide the pilot to Kathy. The wind was rocking the helicopter back and forth, but eventually they were able to hover the front wheels right on top of the snow, with the cabin floor sitting at shoulder height. They struggled to get Kathy on board, but after they did, the helicopter would return to the original drop-off location to pick up the remaining rescue operators. Kathy was suffering from advanced stages of hypothermia and had frozen solid, severely frostbitten hands. Mentally, she was confused but was just able to tell the crew three words, Faye Boudet, buried, burn, which was enough for the rescue crew. They would radio back to John Duffy, who immediately would send out another helicopter to see if they could find the missing teenagers from above, but the weather made that nearly impossible. It soon became clear that the only way to rescue them would be on foot. Ben Beatty and two other rescue operators would be the first to reach the area, with John and a doctor not far behind. After Ben began digging, they soon found six sleeping bags, but there was no sound or sign of life. In the sleeping bags were five students, and the one adult, Sheila, all of them, lifeless. The seventh sleeping bag was found in the middle of the group, but as they began digging, they saw a boy's hand move. The teenager's name was Raymond, and he was still alive. The group frantically dug him out of the snow, and the doctor immediately began tending to him. Additionally, John would take off his jacket and wrap it around the boy. A helicopter was called, and Raymond was immediately taken to a nearby hospital. After the helicopter left, the group would move the bodies to a location that they felt would not be covered in significant snow. Then, they would place poles next to them, so they could be recovered later after the weather improved, and be reunited with their families. 
One of the biggest failures of the expedition was the lack of information provided to the parents. On Sunday afternoon, police had gone to the families to let them know that the group was running behind, but it wasn't until reporters started asking the families questions that they quickly learned their kids were missing. Of course, the families would head to the school outraged and worried because they had no idea their kids would be in this type of danger, and the school had done a poor job of informing them. It wasn't until Monday afternoon that they were told that five of the students had passed away. After inquiries took place, it was found that all of the teenagers, along with Sheila, had died of hypothermia and severe cold exposure. Many of the parents wanted Ben and the school to be held responsible, but eventually it was ruled that although this was a failure of information, it was still an accident. Regulations would be put into place not only in the Cairngorm, but throughout schools in the country. Parents would be better informed, and school trips would be scrutinized to prevent further accidents from happening. Additionally, better training and a certification regime for instructors would be put in place. Raymond and Kathy would be the only survivors of the second group, and to this day, Raymond still does not speak about that trip. Ben Beatty would continue to work in the mountains, but did pass away from a fall while climbing the Himalayas in 1978. Although potential future accidents could be prevented, this one was not, and the impact it had on the community can never be overlooked. Quinn Talley picked up his pace as he was descending Mount Hood. The increasing wind speeds and foggy clouds was a sign the weather conditions were deteriorating. Talley had summited Mount Hood over 20 times, so he was an expert in these matters and did not want to be caught on the peak in a storm. As he made his way down, something out of the corner of his eye made him take a look. What he saw next, he couldn't believe. He rubbed his eye to make sure his mind was not playing tricks on him. But no, it was not a trick. A man was cartwheeling down the mountain in an uncontrollable fall. This is the story of Mia Sumi. Mount Hood is located 50 miles east of Portland, Oregon, and is one of the most unique places in the United States. The mountain is the highest point in the state and has three different elevation levels listed, all within a few feet of each other. But the most recent height stands at 11,240 feet or 3,426 meters. The location and surrounding area is extremely popular to travel to for outdoor adventures. The mountain is surrounded by 12 glaciers that cover about 80% of the peak's surface. Well over 10,000 people travel to the area to hike annually. There are hiking trails that lead up to 8,510 feet on the mountain. In order to reach a higher elevation, you must have the proper climbing equipment and be able to pass small technical challenges. The easiest route to the summit is a climbing class two, which is on the level of only occasionally needing to use your hands while scaling. With all this being said, the mountain is still a dangerous place to spend your afternoon. A large portion of the accidents that occur are from the result of falling rocks or ice in the summer months. This is because the increasing temperatures cause chunks of ice to melt or shift. But perhaps the most interesting feature about Mount Hood is that it is not actually classified as a mountain, but instead it is a volcano, one that experts believe has a 3 to 7% chance of erupting, marking it as potentially active. This adds an extra layer of complexity to mountaineering adventures, because if there is an eruption, not only will lava flow from the mouth of the peak, but deadly gases will also leak from crevasses. Experts have been ramping up the early detection systems within recent years in order to increase public safety. As you can imagine, because of this unique feature and the fact that Mount Hood is surrounded by glaciers, hidden crevasses play a pivotal role in the mountaineering path you take. Generally, under good conditions, these crevasses are not too challenging to overcome. But if a climber is unfamiliar with the route and is in deteriorating weather, hidden crevasses suddenly become much more dangerous. 
In early February 2018, 35-year-old Mia Sumi of Portland, Oregon, along with three other friends, Matt Zavortink, Cheche Thongthap, and Kimberly Anderson, drove the 50 miles from Portland to Mount Hood for an expedition. Mia had already summited the peak three times, and was becoming more familiar with the journey as he gained more knowledge. By no means was he an expert, but Mia had summited a handful of peaks throughout his life and had some mountaineering experience. The group had brought ice axes, ropes, crampons, and helmets, so they were well prepared for the task in front of them. Mia Sumi and his friends started their climb on February 13th, hours before the sun would rise. They planned to make the ascent and descent within the same day, which is normal for those climbing Mount Hood. After getting a bite to eat, having their morning coffee, and putting on their shoes, they set out for the summit. They were following the typical south side route, which is the easiest and most known path one can take. Mia couldn't help but smile as the sun greeted them on the horizon. Mia turned to Matt and told him that he estimated about another hour and a half before they were all standing on the summit. Matt acknowledged Mia's comments as he wiped the sweat off his face. The temperature on the mountain was slightly above freezing. In February, this is not the norm, and many climbers on Mount Hood were taking notice as the higher elevation conditions were beginning to melt in the sunlight. At the time, me and his friends were unaware of this fact and they would keep climbing to the summit. As the hours progressed, the climb became harder and harder, proving to be more difficult than they originally anticipated. Chet Che and Kimberly decided to not go for the summit, and instead, they would wait for Mia and Matt at a lower location. Mia and Matt continued to climb through the snow and shifting ice until their efforts were successful. They stood on top of Mount Hood. Eager to reunite with their friends, they took in the moment for a minute before mentally preparing themselves for their return journey. The 10 a.m. morning sun burned their exposed necks as their legs began to move, initiating the descent. Although the weather was stable and showed no signs of deteriorating, this was very deceiving to inexperienced individuals. Because the temperatures remained above freezing, many of the attached rocks and ice began to melt and tumble down the mountain. It did not take long before the melting got worse as more and larger debris started to fall. Calls began to come into base camp and the rescue center. Nothing too major, but many climbers on the peak became trapped due to the falling debris. Mia and Matt could tell the mountain was shifting, but there was nothing they could do. The pair focused on the task at hand, desperate to be reunited with their two friends. Mia was ahead of Matt and started to descend through a section called the Old Chute which is right under the summit. This section is not particularly challenging, but due to the increase of falling rock and melting ice, the difficulty had an added pressure. Mia continued his descent, wanting to move faster. He quickly stepped on some ice, and that's when it happened. He fell. It was not a slow fall either. Mia's foot lost its grip as his leg was no longer supporting him. He landed on his back, and instantly began tumbling down the mountain. Nothing stopped his fall, and there was nothing Matt could do but sit there and watch his friend tumble over 900 feet down the mountain. Matt started to chase after Mia as fast and safely as he possibly could. Other climbers report eyewitness testimonies of Mia falling down Mount Hood as over a dozen climbers began moving to his crash location. The closest mountaineer was about 200 feet away, and after seeing what happened, he made a call to search and rescue, giving the exact location of Mia. The man would also make his way over to him and stated that he looked to be in bad condition. Mia was still alive, but barely. His vitals were extremely weak, and there was blood leaking out of his ears. The man started performing CPR as more climbers began showing up on scene to help. Eventually, Matt would make it to Mia, where he also participated and performing CPR. They desperately tried to keep him stable, but there's only so much that you can do with the equipment that was available. Finally, after two hours had passed, at 1 p.m., a Black Hawk helicopter lifted Mia off the mountain and escorted him to a Portland hospital. While this was ongoing, Chet Che and Kimberly had no idea what happened to their friends, but instead they faced their own problems the falling rocks and ice caused them to be trapped, and to make matters worse, 
As they were trying to take shelter, a falling ice chunk struck Kimberly, causing her to become immobile. Kimberly would call rescuers, crying to them and asking for updates on Mia, but at the same time, they could not provide any, and they were left in the dark. It would take hours before Kimberly and Cheche were rescued by a sled. It was only after they had all made it back safely when the news broke to the group. Mia had passed away. Although Mount Hood is often considered a beginner's peak, and it is a popular location for inexperienced mountaineers, the dangers cannot be understated. Due to the unique attributes and the varying weather conditions, this story serves as a reminder that no matter how easy the peak may seem, there is always deadly traps ready to catch you if you are not careful. Matt and his friends would go on to thank all of the climbers that assisted in the rescue and for those that helped perform CPR for over 90 minutes. Climbers on the slopes of Washington's Mount Rainier caught video of one of the biggest avalanches ever recorded. It was cold, unpredictable, and worst of all, deadly. Witnesses say the ground shook as this happened as the mix of rock and ice roared thousands of feet. On Sunday morning, June 21st, 1981, a group of 23 novice mountain climbers led by six professional mountaineering guides departed Paradise Inn at 5,400 feet on Mount Rainier. They had just completed a demanding one-day course in basic mountaineering climbing skills, and they were heading to Camp Muir to spend the night. Mountaineering is often considered an extreme sport with many cases ending in tragedy. With that being said, Mount Rainier is not considered a dangerous mountain, but that does not mean it doesn't come without its risks. Approximately 7% of mountaineering deaths in the United States are attributed to the peak, with most dangers coming from ice fall or avalanches. And on the morning of June 21st, what the many people on Mount Rainier did not know was that high above them, on a known landmark called the Disappointment Cleaver, the Ingram Glacier fractured, leading to one of the most deadly mountaineering disasters in North American history. This is the story of the 1981 Mount Rainier Avalanche. Mount Rainier Summit is at an elevation level of 14,411 feet and stands at the tallest mountain in the U.S. state of Washington. The peak is located in Mount Rainier National Park, about 59 miles southeast of Seattle. On clear days, the mountain can be seen as far away as Oregon. 26 glaciers make up its surface, with the mountain being the most heavily glaciated peak in the contiguous United States. The summit is actually made up of two volcanic craters, each over 1,000 feet in diameter. The geothermal heat keeps the crater's rim free of ice and snow, providing a unique summit experience for all climbers. Tim O'Brien was not your average teenager. The 19-year-old Mount Rainier guide loved the mountains more than anything. Born and raised in Oregon, his free time was spent obsessing over climbing, and by the time he was 18, Tim was a sufficient mountaineer. He was well versed in ice climbing, self and team arrest techniques, pressure breathing to maximize oxygen intake at high altitudes, and even knew how to rest stop an advanced climbing technique to force the weight of your body on your bones in order to rest your muscles. Due to his unique skills, Tim would be asked and eventually hired as a guide for Mount Rainier. On the morning of June 19, 1981, Tim, along with five other guides, would be hosting a physically demanding one-day basic mountaineering training course in preparation for their summit climb in two days. The training consisted of over 23 inexperienced climbers, varying from ages of 18 to 45. Tim, along with his fellow guides, spent the day becoming familiar with the expedition members as they got to know one another. 
They hiked their way through Mount Rainier National Park with many inclined and declines. This gave the guides a good perspective on the level of athletic condition each climber had and if they would be set up for the task of summoning a 14,000 foot volcano. While they hiked, the guides would occasionally stop the group and explain a technique or tool that could be demonstrated on the proper environment. The group responded well to each guide as they went about their day with no issues. Tim noticed that everyone seemed to be paying attention and were being very cautious of their surroundings. He thought to himself that he was lucky. This group was proving to be better than the last. They continued trekking through the thin snow and melting ice for hours until each guide was satisfied and confident in each expedition member's ability. The inexperienced mountaineers did not know at the time, but this was their first major test. If any climber showed signs of weakness and ability to breathe, or just not up to the physical standard required, then their guide is the last line of defense before they enter a situation where they could not come back from. On Saturday morning, June 20th, 1981, all 29 members of the expedition were well rested from the night before. They had stayed at Paradise Inn, which is a well-known tavern located in Mount Rainier National Park that boasts a getaway from modern world distractions. In fact, the Mount Rainier Guidehouse is located above Paradise Inn, making it a popular destination before going out on the mountain. Some climbers had breakfast together while others kept to themselves. But when it was time, all of the climbing guides gathered the 23 novice mountaineers together and went over their plan. The route was discussed and walked through. The dangers when climbing and what to look out for were discussed. And finally, the meeting ended with the stereotypical phrase of have fun. When they were all ready, the inexperienced mountain climbers, accompanied by their guides, departed Paradise Inn. The group was led by senior guide John Day. Now the other five guides still played a pivotal role in the group's success as they were tasked with looking after specific individuals. But John's word would be the final say, and if he said turn around, they would all listen. Their destination for today was to reach Camp Muir, which is located a little over 10,000 feet in elevation. Camp Muir is a climber's camp with an impressive stone shelter, a couple of outbuildings, and toilets. Climbers usually hike to Camp Muir the day before they attempt the summit in order to rest and acclimate to the altitude. Most people actually don't consider the route up to Camp Muir a hike. It is more so a mix of hiking and climbing. The group had to walk 2.3 miles before their true route began at Pebble Creek. This is typically a good place to stop, put on sunscreen, throw on a hat, and make sure your shoes are tied. Hikers that make it to this point are rewarded with a scenic view of Mount Rainier. After leaving Pebble Creek, the group started encountering rocky outcroppings and the snow patches became larger and larger. Before long, snow covered the entire route. The weather, as predicted, held up well. The group took many breaks throughout the day to rest their legs, get a bite to eat, and to stay hydrated. After a few hours, they were on the last 500 feet of the climb which is the steepest and most difficult section. Specifically in this area, one must look out for hidden crevasses as they play a part in the path one takes. But the group handled it well and proceeded without issues. There was no time to celebrate upon reaching Camp Muir. Each climber was instructed to eat and sleep as they had a very early day ahead of them. At approximately 3.30 a.m., well before the sun would rise, the group started to wake up. John, Tim, and the rest of the guides checked on each climber before giving instructions on how they wanted the group to prepare. Although it was early, everybody was awake and alert. There was a buzz in the air. The guides knew it, and the climbers felt it. This is what they came here to do. It was summit day. The expedition planned to follow the standard route up Mount Rainier, otherwise called the Disappointment Cleaver Route. This path up to the summit is the only maintained and marked route by guide services. 
which will assist John, Tim, and the other guides in leading the group of inexperienced climbers up the peak. One of the most common risks for novice mountaineers is simply getting lost. By taking the standard route, the team mitigates this risk. Despite the excitement, John took a few minutes to calm everyone down, set their expectations in line with the day ahead, and instructed everyone to eat something before they move. On average, the climb takes about six to eight hours from Camp Muir to Mount Rainier's summit. John could clearly see the stars in the dark morning sky. There were no clouds that obstructed his view, and the weather predictions done earlier in the week indicated clear skies. John would smile at the other guides and remark how the weather was excellent for a climb. The temperature was hovering right above 30 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative one degrees Celsius. So it was cold, but nothing too worrisome. After confirming the entire party was ready, John instructed them to break up into six different groups, with one guide leading each. There were about five individuals in each group, and they would be roped together in order to prevent individuals from wandering off or falling down a crevasse. At 3.50 a.m., they set off from Camp Muir. They crossed the Cowlitz Glacier and made their way to the top of Cathedral Gap. John let the group know they should be on high alert as this area is known for large rock falls and avalanches. The guides were meticulous with their rope placement while climbing because a hard pull could result in stray debris falling under them. After everyone successfully made the traverse, the terrain's steepness drastically increased. The marked path now turned to the west, the direct direction towards the summit. Many climbers were holding up well to this point, although there were one or two individuals already showing signs of fatigue. The group continued to climb and made their way up the inclined slope for about 500 feet where they reached Ingram Flats camp on the Ingram Glacier. John began instructing the group to take a break and get off their legs. Some climbers began resulting, some climbers began rustling in their packs looking for a snack while others took a sip from their canteens. Ingram Flats is a well-known camping site and a popular resting destination. For those attempting the summit, there is limited space and most expeditions don't actually camp here, but occasionally individuals will to make their summit bid easier. A few minutes went by and John noticed some of the climbers talking together and gathering. John would walk over to their location to better hear what they were discussing, and three novice climbers decided they were too tired to continue. Hearing this, John asked out of all the guides who was willing to lead the three individuals back down the mountain to Camp Muir. Chris Lynch, a 23-year-old guide, volunteered. John would help them get organized and make sure they were comfortable before letting Chris take over. John refocused his attention on the remaining 25 climbers and reorganized the groups into five rope teams. Individuals began repacking their bags and standing on their feet. It was time to move again. The rising sun illuminated the horizon, providing more natural light and revealing hidden crevasses in the distance that were previously hidden in the night. After leaving Ingram Flats camp, they made their way to the base of the disappointment cleaver. John did not like the look of the loose snow above him, so the group paused while they evaluated the integrity of the snow. John, along with two other guides, Whitaker and Target, who were both knowledgeable about avalanches, unhooked themselves from the groups and proceeded to walk towards the nose, a small rocky section. Here they dug snow pits, where they shovel stacked layers of deep snow to learn how compact and stable it was. Tim and the others patiently waited to hear the news as they watched the men huddle together. John eventually turned around to face the group with his mind made up. The snow was too unstable to continue and there was no clear path above them. John determined for the safety of the group, it was best to turn around. And now he took a step towards the group and was about to speak when a large crack was heard. Approximately 800 feet above them, a very large serac at the top of Disappointment Cleaver broke off and toppled over. 
Several massive ice blocks crashed rapidly down the slope, creating an unusually large snow and ice avalanche. John watched as a 300-foot wall of ice tumbled towards them. Larry St. Peter, a novice mountaineer in the group, later remarked that he vividly remembered everyone pausing like it was a fireworks show and going ooh. Dennis Robertson, another climber, also commented how the majority of the group just stood still. That's when they all heard John yell, run. To their credit, many of them did try to run, but when that much ice and snow is coming your way, there is only so much one can do. Most of them were unable to make it out of the path and were swept off their feet. It all happened in a matter of seconds, and then silence. The cloud of snow and ice dissipated. John was one of the few people untouched and made a quick observation of his surroundings. Within minutes, he spotted 11 climbers and all of his guides, except for Tim. He directed them to a safer location out of the snow's path. A lookout was chosen by John to watch for any more debris that may fall, and the others were instructed to begin looking for missing climbers. John took this opportunity to call into Camp Muir and let them know of the situation. They quickly organized help, but they would be hours away. John went to help the surviving climbers look for their missing comrades. Occasionally, a pair of glasses would be found or other personal belongings, but they did not find any of the missing climbers. The group found out that some of the avalanche path ended in a crevasse. And after searching for 30 minutes, John called it off, claiming that the situation was hopeless. It was assumed the missing climbers had either been swept into the crevasses or buried under abundance of snow. With little to do, John instructed two of the surviving guides to take all of the remaining clients back to Camp Muir. However, one of the clients volunteered to stay and help out with whatever was needed. John, his fellow guide Target, and a group of independent climbers stayed and waited. Two and a half hours passed painfully slow. There was nothing the group could do and the mood was so negative nobody wanted to speak. At approximately 9 a.m., Olsen, a park ranger, accompanied by other climbers, arrived at the scene to help. However, the weather had turned for the worse. Visibility became obscure with heavy snowfall. The team would search for 45 minutes until they found a backpack, ice axe, and headlamp. With increasingly poor conditions, the search was called off, not wanting to risk the lives of rescuers. By 11 a.m., the survivors had made it back to Camp Muir. The route on the mountain would be shut down one hour later. The next morning, three separate rescue teams were constructed, each with multiple park rangers, volunteers, and mountain rescue members. They left Camp Muir at various times, but all within a couple hours of each other. The teams would spend most of the day digging above and below the crevasses looking for any signs of life. It was hard work and the added pressure only contributed to the seriousness. By the afternoon, the weather worsened again, preventing more searches to be held. Forty hours after the incident, the search and rescue was called off. Experts cited that it was too dangerous for search personnel to be on the mountain under the current conditions. And the fact that the avalanche was so brutal, it is extremely unlikely anyone could have survived if they were swept off their feet. By noon the next day, news articles and mountaineer officials would call it the worst mountaineering disaster in the United States history. It was impossible for the group to predict what would happen, and there was no one at fault. They had guides, took the necessary precautions, and were all careful. But that's the thing about mountaineering. 
Sometimes there are unpredictable factors outside one's control. And in 2018, we quite literally saw history repeated itself. The Ingram Glacier collapsed on the exact same landmark in 1981. Disappointment Cleaver. A massive avalanche followed that experts claimed was an unsurvivable event. Luckily, there was nobody in the path of the falling snow, but the pictures will send shivers down your spine. Thank you all for watching. Until next time. And to those who lost their life in 1981, may you rest in peace. Wanda Rutkovich once said, I don't seek death, but I don't mind if it happens in the mountains. It would be an easy death for me. Many of my friends are waiting for me in the mountains. Over the span of 30 years, Wanda became arguably the greatest female mountaineer in the world. She climbed the tallest and most difficult mountains around the globe, often becoming one of the first women to eclipse each peak. And on most of her climbs, she would not use supplementary oxygen, marking her accomplishments even more impressive. She was a true alpine climber, someone who set out to climb mountains with only the items she could carry and did all this between 1962 to 1992. Today, climbing one of the 14 8,000 meter peaks is difficult, but many guides, porters, and companies can walk you to the top. This was not how Wanda Rutkovich climbed. During her life, she completed eight 8,000ers, the most by a woman at the time, and she planned on becoming the first female to complete all 14 peaks. But in the mountains, nothing is for certain. Over her 25 years of climbing, Wanda lost over 30 friends to the sport. Some of these friends would die while climbing with her, but it never stopped Wanda from continuing the climb. When asked about this, Wanda would state, as selfish as it is, it wasn't my death. I keep on living. As long as I have been creating videos about mountaineering, I have learned one thing. To be a great climber and one of the true legends, you have to be a little crazy. Wanda fits that description. This is her story. Today's video is going to be a little different from my usual videos. I'm going to focus on Wanda Rutkovich's life and how she became one of the greatest mountaineers of her time before focusing on her final climb. If you want to skip to the events of her specific expedition, I will put timestamps in the description. On February 4, 1943, Wanda Rutkiewicz was born in Plunge, Lithuania to an educated Polish family. Following the conclusion of World War II in 1945, the family moved to Poland and would settle permanently in Wrocław. Wanda had an older brother that was two years older than her and they were very similar but also competitive at a young age. Their mother did not work professionally and was a homemaker. She homeschooled the children until 1949 when Wanda would join an elementary school in second grade. Her father was the breadwinner and an ambitious man that clearly shaped the character of his children. He worked as an engineer and designer and he loved sports. Wanda took after him in this regard and always strived to be the best in whatever she did, whether it was primary school, volleyball, or track and field. Just succeeding was not good enough for her. She had to be number one. In elementary school, she showed her athletic prowess by being a multi-sport athlete that excelled. Every day before school, Wanda trained with her school coaches in track and field. She competed in multiple running events, high jump, long jump, discus throw, and her strongest event, shot put. Those that knew Wanda attributed her drive to be the best due to the tragic accident when she was five. Wanda, along with her brother and some friends, were playing outside one day in Wrocław. The group stumbled upon an unexpected bomb from the war. Wanda was not close enough to be physically affected, but she watched as her brother and some of his friends were blown up in front of her. All of Wanda's hard work in track and field would pay off in 1961, where she competed in the Polish University Club Championship. Here she clinched a gold medal in shot put. 
Wanda would also excel in school at the Polytechnic Institute and even join their volleyball team despite being relatively short for the sport. The team had great success and Wanda played a pivotal role in that. Leading up to the 1964 Olympics, there were rumors she was getting scouted for the Polish national team, but a random encounter completely changed the trajectory of her life. Climbing was a hobby for Wanda, but she certainly did not take it seriously or even consider a future in the sport. In fact, her passion for climbing developed by mere chance. On a random summer day in 1961, Wanda was riding her motorcycle when she ran out of fuel. Waving for assistance from passing travelers, a man named Bogdan Janowski stopped to help. Bogdan was a seasoned climber and would invite Wanda to join him on his next adventure. She would take him up on this offer and they climbed the Falcon Mountains in Poland. After her trip, she could not get the climb out of her head. She was hooked. Wanda soon found herself entrenched deep in the Tatra Mountains, otherwise known as the Polish Alps. She had joined the Wrocław High Mountain Club and was taking part of a mountaineering training course. She of course passed with flying colors, and her trainers noted her enormous willpower and strength. Wanda was so competitive that she would find a stronger climber and attempt to beat them at their own game. But this was only the start. After the Tatra Mountains, Wanda traveled to the Alps, where she completed the Triple Crown, the hardest challenge the range could provide. The Triple Crown means an individual summited the 4,805 meter Mount Blanc, the Eiger at 3,967 meters, and the deadly Matterhorn at 4,468 meters. An impressive feat that only advanced mountaineers accomplish. And Wanda did it very early in her career. She would continue to advance her skills, and before long, she felt ready to tackle new heights. Wanda would go on to marry her first husband, a mathematician with the last name Rukovich. Although they separated quickly due to Wanda's love of mountaineering, to her the mountains came first, and everything else in her life was a sub-priority. Wanda would end up keeping his last name throughout her life. Following her marriage, the 27-year-old embarked on her first 7,000-meter peak, Lenin in Pamir. The team was made up of all males, except for Wanda, and it was honestly hard for her to fit in. They did not respect her like they did the other men, and so she found herself in constant battles with them. Despite successfully reaching the summit, she did not enjoy the expedition, but this trip would play a critical role in her life. Because of her struggles, she thought to herself, why not make an all-female mountaineering team? Wanda would go on to make her dream a reality in 1975, when she coordinated and led an all-female mountaineering expedition on Gasherbrum 3. The peak stands at 7,946 meters, not quite an 8,000er, but you would be hard pressed to find another mountain that's close to the mark. They would be successful, and this would be the start to Wanda's notoriety. Her name began popping up in newspapers and magazines as it was harder and harder to deny her skills. The following years, Wanda made multiple attempts to conquer a Himalayan peak, but was unsuccessful after she fell ill with meningitis. This was a severe setback and delaying her climbing for years as she had to relearn basic motor skills such as walking and talking. But of course, knowing Wanda's personality, she was determined to return to the mountains and conquer the highest peaks. Due to her challenging climbs and successful summits, Wanda earned a reputation as one of the most formidable mountaineers in Europe. This would lead to an invitation from a German climber to join an international expedition of Everest. Hearing of this opportunity, Wanda was excited, and she could not say no. But once again, she struggled to fit in with her male peers. Gender equality was not viewed the same in 1970s, and many of the men felt insecure that a female mountaineer was as strong as Wanda. Because of this, she was treated poorly. Fed up with the expedition, but undeterred from continuing, Wanda decided she would climb alone. Now, 
I want to pause here to explain how difficult this truly is. Given the time period, there was not any external help on the mountain like you have today. If one was lucky, there would be an established guideline for the high altitude traverses. But if there was not, then you had to lay the line yourself. On top of that, there were very few to no other expeditions on the mountain at the same time. There was nobody on the mountain coming to save you. All climbers had to accept this grim fact before starting their journey. The only supplies she had were the things that she could carry on her back. She would have to trailblaze her route, forcing her way through waist-deep snow and below freezing temperatures. Not even the strongest mountaineers attempt to climb Everest or really any 8,000 meter peak this way in today's standards. It is almost impossible to replicate a similar climb on Everest today without major coordination and approval. The climb was tough and taxing, but her experience played a pivotal role in her journey. This is her dream, and she accepted the dangers that came along with it. Unfortunately, midway through her climb, her oxygen mass clogged with ice and was unusable. But that's the thing, none of these challenges mattered to her. She just kept going, and on October 16, 1978, she would stand on the tallest mountain in the world, alone. She became the third woman in history and the first European woman to summit the mountain. Her climb, to this day, is one of the most impressive Everest scales in history. It catapulted her to stardom and cemented her as a mountaineering legend. Wanda could no longer hide who she was. After her summit, she was thrown into the spotlight and found herself giving interviews almost daily. Wanda would eventually return to Poland to continue her successful career as a computer engineer. But as the years went by, something was missing. She desperately yearned for the mountains. Wanda continued to believe that gender bias played a big role in her mountaineering experiences. Wanting to replicate her all-female expedition idea, she organized a strong team of exclusively women. Their goal was ambitious, the second tallest mountain in the world, the Savage Mountain, K2 which most mountaineers considered to be the most difficult 8,000er and one of the hardest peaks to summit on the planet. Wanda did not take the task lightly. As the team traveled to the Caucasus for a rigorous training regime, they faced harsh conditions and strong weather, but ultimately would successfully summit Elbrus, a 5,642 meter volcano. But on their descent, a skier accidentally bumped into her, causing her to tumble over 200 meters down the slope. This accident resulted in a broken femur. She received urgent medical help and underwent surgery to repair her leg, but would still require months of physical therapy. Wanda exercised so intensely during physical therapy that she actually suffered from repeated fractures. Despite this injury, Wanda still wanted to continue the expedition. The expedition was made up of 12 strong female climbers, all wanting to make history, but they would not be ready until 1982. Wanda traveled to K2 base camp on crutches. Yes, you heard that right. She traveled to K2 planning to climb with crutches. This memory is still talked about to this day by the local carriers around K2. She is remembered as the crazy Polish woman. Although the task seemed impossible, Wanda would state she wanted to achieve something others deemed unattainable. Although the journey proved to be extremely difficult for her, she heavily relied on her friends, painkillers, and fought through many tears. Eventually, Wanda and the expedition would make it to K2's base camp. The team was established and began preparations. Climbers were sent up to higher camps to place supplies and carve out the route. However, they would hit a roadblock when one of the expedition members, named Talina, suddenly lost consciousness in a higher camp and tragically passed away. Despite the death, the all-female expedition kept trying to reach the summit, stating Helena would have wanted that. They would be unsuccessful due to extreme weather conditions and had to call off the expedition. Despite the outcome, an all-female team certainly made headlines and caught the notice of other fellow mountaineers. This failure was only another speed bump in Wanda's career. In that same year, she would go on to summit the Killer Mountain Nanga Parvat.
Wanda would have another failed attempt at K2 in 1985, and she would try again in 1986, a part of a French expedition. This was her third attempt for the summit, and they only had a few days to push for it. The weather on the mountain had been brutally tough that year, resulting in 13 deaths on the peak. Determined to make her final push, Wanda seized the opportunity when she had clear skies. Her climbing mates, Lillian and Maurice Berard, decided to stay and rest so Wanda was forced to climb alone, once again, and climb she did, until eventually Wanda Rukovich stood on top of K2, making history as the first woman to ever summit the mountain. What made this feat even more impressive is the fact that she did it by herself and without supplemental oxygen, the most pure form of alpine climbing. She met back up with her friends, Lillian and Maurice, on her descent as they continued together. However, after a few hundred meters, the weather turned harsh and Wanda lost them in the storm. She waited at camp for her companions to return, but they never would. Despite reaching the summit of K2 that same day, Wanda would climb back up the mountain in the storm to look for her friends. She eventually had to return due to the difficult conditions. Other climbers on the mountain noted that Wanda returned to base camp completely covered in snow and ice. Her skin was pale and she was barely breathing. Most consider this climb to be the greatest achievement of her mountaineering career. Wanda was later asked why she continued to climb. At this point, she had lost so many friends to the sport. Wanda would reply, as selfish as it is, it wasn't my death. I keep on living. After her K2 summit, Wanda recognized that she asked others to put themselves in deadly situations. She was willing to do that to herself, but no longer for other people. This stage of her life marked the end of trying to build an all-female expedition, and instead, focusing on herself. From 1986 to 1991, she would achieve many successful summits. As her accomplishments grew, her fame and notoriety also reached new heights. Wanda had become such a strong mountaineer, most males couldn't keep up. Those that knew her in the later years called her selfish because she only cared about her own ambitions. In 1990, Wanda did begin to think about her life outside of the mountains. She fell in love with a man, but tragically, he would fall on Broad Peak and pass away in front of her eyes. After this experience, it was like a switch and Wanda flipped. She took the death really hard, and those around her claimed she was really in love. She no longer talked about her future. All she said was her new goal was to conquer all 14 8,000 meter peaks. With only six more 8,000 meter peaks left to summit, the 49 year old chose Kanchenjunga as her next option, which stands at 8,586 meters. She had attempted the peak two times before, and both times were unsuccessful. The expedition was a disaster from the start. Four members of the team had to withdraw due to severe illnesses, leaving only Wanda and her friend Carlos from Mexico. During their climb, Carlos noticed Wanda's pace was abnormal. She was slow. But Carlos considered her a legend, so not wanting to overstep, he allowed her to go at her own pace. It was a hard climb, and both climbers faced tough weathers. Carlos would eventually reach the top and begin his descent. On the way down, he would pass Wanda and again visibly notice she looked weak, but Wanda told him she was fine and he trusted her expertise. There was nobody more equipped for the mountains than her, so who was he to tell her otherwise? Carlos returned to camp fully expecting Wanda to return, but she never would. The body of the world's first lady of Himalayan mountaineering was never found. Her mother believed until the end of her life that her daughter had abandoned the Western world for a peaceful life in one of the Buddhist monasteries. The story of Wanda Rukovich is on the one hand a tale of self-destruction, and on the other, a story of how through strength of will, ambition, and great determination, dreams can be fulfilled and goals achieved. The Polish same has proclaimed 2022 as the year of Wanda Rukovich.
On Tuesday, September 6, 2022, a three-day rescue operation would conclude on the tallest active volcano in Eurasia named Kluchevska Sopka. Twelve climbers had attempted to scale the slopes nearly a week prior, but the events of the expedition would be anything but normal, and the conclusion of the climb would lead to a year-long investigation that led to criminal charges being raised against a mountaineering company. It is one of Russia's deadliest mountaineering tragedies ever. But what really happened on the volcano, and what could cause criminal charges to be raised against a company that organized the expedition, this is their story. On the far east of Russia lies a peninsula called the Kamchatka Krai region. Under the Soviet area, the Kamchatka region was classified as top secret, but recently the region is opening up to more tourists, revealing its beauty. The peninsula is surrounded by the Sea of Ahoksk on its left side and the Bering Sea on its right. While the region is known for its production of fruits such as caviar, it is most famous for its seismic activity. There are over 160 volcanoes in the region but many of them are currently dormant. Of the 160, 28 to 36 are active, which is enough to make the region a UNESCO World Heritage Area. This means it is a protected area that has significance to our planet because of its seismic and volcanic activity. The volcanoes have impacted the region so much that it is represented in its flag and considered sacred by its indigenous communities. It is no surprise with all the volcanoes that earthquakes are common in the area. In fact, as I am writing this story, there has already been another just off the coast on August 29th. Russian media says a volcano has erupted following a 7 magnitude earthquake that struck off Russia's coast. A 7.0 magnitude earthquake struck off Russia's east coast, triggering the eruption of the Shivaluch volcano, the quake's epicenter. While most of the earthquakes occur miles away from land, one of the most dangerous consequences of these shifts is tsunamis. In 1959, a magnitude 8 earthquake would strike the region, not only causing damages across the peninsula, but also sending a tsunami halfway across the globe to the U.S. coast. Since the area has been open to the public, it has become very popular for tourists who are interested in sightseeing, hiking, or more personal favorite, bathing in the hot springs. There are many nature reserves scattered throughout the peninsula, and because of the moderate weather near the coast, it is a popular area year-round. As you travel inward, the winters become harsher and the summers hotter. But this has not stopped climbers who look to scale the various volcanoes. Out of the 160 volcanoes in the Kamchatka Peninsula, the tallest of them all is Kluchevska Sopka. It is actually not only the tallest in the region, but all of Eurasia, standing at approximately 4,750 meters or 15,584 feet. I say approximately because the actual height of the volcano shifts slightly each year. Kluchevska Sopka is a symmetrical cone that towers over the region. Because of this, it has become one of the most popular climbing sites in the entire peninsula, but this climb has no lack of danger. The volcano is a top crater, meaning the most intense eruptions come from the very top, producing powerful explosions, lava flows, and ash clouds. Since the 1700s, Kluchevska has erupted more than 50 times, and it has been erupting periodically every five to six years on average. Some of its recent eruptions include December 2020, November 2022, and June 2023. The route to ascend the volcano runs along its northwestern slope. The path is known to be one of its most treacherous as it winds through volcanic rock, ice, and snow. The route begins at an altitude of 800 meters, but base camp would be established within a volcanologist's hut at 1,435 meters. From there, climbers would scale the slope, winding their way through the snow, ice, and rock to Camp 1 at 2,000 meters, then another volcanologist's hut at 3,300 meters, and finally the summit at 4,750 meters. Another factor in the climb is the many crevasses that litter the route. This is why climbers scale the 35 degree slope tied together with a rope and using anchors. This is an important detail that plays a part in all expeditions in this region. This technique is used due to the fact that if one climber were to slip and fall down the slope, the remaining climbers can attempt to brace the impact and stop the fall by using their anchors combined with their own body weight. If this does not work, there is always a last ditch effort where a climber would desperately swing their ice axe into the slope, hopefully lodging their tool deep enough to cause their body and thus the body of others to stop sliding. 
Because of the height of the volcano at nearly 5,000 meters, climbers typically complete acclimatization climbs to prepare for the summit. This means they would scale to a particular height and stay there for a few hours or a night before descending back to base camp then repeat this process at a higher altitude each time, before the final summit push is attempted. This can prepare your body for the higher altitudes where there is less oxygen in the air and hopefully delay or prevent high altitude sickness, where severe cases can lead to death. The closer you get to the summit of Kluchevska Sopka, the more difficult the climb becomes, not only from the altitude, slope, and ice, but also because of the weather. Because the volcano is still active, there is volcanic ash and gases in the air, which can cause drastic weather changes, but more importantly, it makes it impossible for rescue helicopters to fly near the summit. This means as the climb continues to get more difficult, climbers move further and further away from help. On Tuesday, August 30th, 2022, an expedition would begin on Kluchevska. Extreme Time Adventure had advertised the expedition for many months across social media, and 10 climbers from across the country had signed up for the trip. Two guides would be leading the expedition, but everyone was a stranger to one another. They would all be meeting for the first time at the foot of the volcano. Andre Machenko, one of the two guides, was an extremely fit person who had spent his early career as a train driver on the railroad, but after he tried mountain climbing, he fell in love. He would eventually leave the railroad, instead becoming a mountain guide. Andre had climbed the Kluchevska volcano 13 times before this expedition, meaning he was more experienced than most guides. His bio on the Extreme Time Adventure stated, When Andre starts talking, everyone listens. His stories make you fall in love with the mountains and occasionally give food for thought. Andre first traveled to the mountains in 2001 while doing military service in the Caucasus, and later they became an important part of his life. He has been working as a guide and mountaineering instructor in our team for more than five years in the Alta region. Ivan Alabugin, the other guide, began his mountaineering career while still in high school and was by all accounts capable of leading an expedition on the volcano. Additionally, his bio on Extreme Time Adventure would state, Ivan has been in our team for more than eight years. An experienced instructor for mountaineering programs, he has conducted successful Baluka Massif traverses for commercial groups. This is unique experience. Ivan also leads treks of varying difficulty in Nepal, Turkey, the Crimea, and around Lake Bacal. The group was registered with the Russian Ministry of Emergency Situations, as was required to make the climb. Typically, all climbers are required to be citizens of Russia or have a visa and permits if not, because the volcano borders a top-secret military zone. The first mistake of the expedition was that Extreme Time Adventure, owned by Andrei Stepanov, had failed to acquire permits for the climb even after applying a year earlier. Instead, he still organized the expedition as the 10 climbers had paid roughly a total total of 11,100 US dollars to make the trip. The first few days of the expedition were spent organizing and preparing to summit the peak. The group of 12 had acclimatized for the climb, but the process had been rushed, mainly because many members had bought cheap airline tickets back home and were on a specific time frame. The group would have to finish the expedition before September 9th. The slopes of the volcano were extremely icy and compact, meaning the conditions were more difficult to climb rather than soft snow, and one fall could be disastrous. Anastasia Yushachova and Roman Avirin, two climbers on the expedition, would struggle against the steep slope and fall behind on the acclimatization trips as their bodies were having a more difficult time adjusting to the altitude. The guides noticed this, but did not prevent the two from continuing as they had already paid. The first four days of the expedition would come and go, and everything would be as you expect. The group would make slow progress up the slopes, but were still on their planned schedule, so the guides did not feel worried. It would take four days of coordination and climbing before reaching the volcanologist's hut at 3,300 meters, where they would rest before making the final push to the summit. On the morning of September 3rd, 2022, 
the expedition would kick off by leaving the hut at 3,300 meters. The first 700 meters went according to schedule, but at nearly 4,000 meters, climbers Anastasia Yusachova and Roman Aviren began doubting their abilities to make the summit. Both climbers were in the beginning stages of high altitude sickness and would make the decision to turn around for their own safety. One of the guides, Ivan Alabugin, would accompany the duo, eventually leading them back to camp at 3,300 meters, where they would rest before attempting to descend further. While the three climbers began their descent, the remaining nine would continue climbing towards the summit. But there was one crucial error. Because one of the guides would have to descend the mountain, this left the remaining eight climbers being led by Andrei Mashinkov, tying themselves together. This was in case one of the climbers were to slip and fall. This technique is best reserved for small groups, but because there was only one guide, they were now all linked together. The group would continue like this without realizing they just made a crucial error. And to top it all off, the group had failed to belay, meaning they were all connected to a rope that was not anchored into the rock or snow. Should someone slip and fall, this could drag the entire group down with them. Since they were not anchored into the slope, the only way to stop a slide would be if someone could dig their ice axe deep enough into the snow. But remember, the group was nine members. This would be simply too large and nearly impossible for one person to stop the slide. Andrei Machenko, the guide who did not descend the mountain, would be leading the group of nine toward the summit. The weather was calm, but he noticed the subtle signs that there was a storm coming, and the group needed to reach the top and begin the descent before late afternoon to avoid it. It had been a few hours since his fellow guide Ivan and the two other climbers had left the group at 4,000 meters to descend the peak. The remaining eight climbers Andre was leading were all in good spirits. They were eager to reach the top. Just 500 meters away, at 4,200 meters, Andre was making his way through an icy area when he heard something behind him. At first, he wasn't sure what it was, but he felt a pull at his waist. As the rope attached to him began to tighten, he instantly recognized what had happened. Someone had slipped. One of the expedition members had slipped down a crevasse falling nearly 30 meters to a group of rocks below. But this fall started a chain reaction and moments later Andre would be falling as well. For a second, he had no control of his body anymore. A terrifying thought when you are 4,200 meters high. Then Andre would feel a sharp pain in his leg before finally coming to a stop. It took him a second to digest what had happened, but he quickly realized that someone had slipped, then two had fallen, then another group, until they all slid down the slope. They couldn't have picked a worse spot to do it at either, as there was a group of rocks below that would provide no break from the fall. Andre, feeling pain in his leg, would look down to see that it was clearly broken at an odd angle. But it only took him a few seconds to realize the lack of noise he was hearing, or should I say, didn't hear. It would be minutes before he could assess the scene. He slowly crawled his way following the rope where he would find that seven climbers were unresponsive. What he didn't know is that five climbers had died instantly in the fall and another would stand no chance from their injuries and pass shortly after discovery. One more climber was unconscious but still breathing. Andre barely able to move could only do one thing, pull out his satellite phone and radio down to Ivan to let him know an accident had occurred. After Ivan learned what had happened, he would immediately radio for help from the Russian authorities, then begin preparations to ascend back up the mountain. He would pack additional sleeping bags, a tent, and first aid equipment, then begin the several hour climb to the fall area. A few hours after the accident, the worst case scenario would play out. A snowstorm would begin near the summit, with temperatures at 7 degrees Fahrenheit and wind speeds of 15 to 20 meters per second. The combination of bad weather and location made it impossible for a rescue helicopter to evacuate the surviving climbers. Additionally, the ground rescue team could make little progress because of the heavy snow and volcanic ash falling off the volcano, eventually forcing them to set up camp at 1,400 meters. They would need at least another two days of climbing before reaching the group. After the ground rescue failed to make significant progress, a helicopter would attempt to scale the mountain as high as possible in the late afternoon. They managed to reach 1,600 meters but would fail to climb any higher due to the conditions. The helicopter would then drop a rescue team onto the volcano before turning back. These climbers would quickly begin making their way towards the summit. 
Over the next few hours, both rescue groups and Ivan attempted to progress on the volcano, but only Ivan found success climbing through heavy snowfall and low visibility. Andre would be waiting in the fall area. He had tried to hunker himself and the others down as best as possible to protect from the weather, but their thin tent hardly provided any shelter and definitely would not keep them warm. It was late afternoon when they saw a familiar face approaching them from afar. It was Ivan. He had reached them. And for the first time in hours, Andre had hope. As the sun set on September 3rd, both rescue teams set camp and hunkered down for the night. The temperature continued to drop, and the group of four huddled into a thin tent trying to stay warm. But it was to no avail. During the night, two more climbers would fight for their lives, but ultimately pass away due to the extreme conditions, leaving only Ivan and Andre. But with Andre's broken leg, the duo could do little but try to keep each other warm and try to survive the night. In the early hours of the morning on Sunday, September 4th, Andre, the final member from the original nine that had attempted to reach the summit, passed away due to the weather conditions and his own critical health. Ivan had stayed with Andre until his final moments. The entire time, he kept his spirits high and tried to provide him comfort. After Andre passed away, Ivan made the decision that he would descend the peak back to the volcanologist's hut at 3,300 meters. There was nothing left for him under the summit except for the bodies of his fellow climbers. Ivan spent most of the day descending from 4,200 meters back to 3,300 meters, where the other two climbers, Anastasia and Roman, were waiting for him, anxious to hear what had happened further up on the peak. Within the hut, the trio had plenty of supplies and fuel to last them until the weather began to subside. September 5th would come and go, and the three climbers would stay hunkered down within the hut while snowfall continued around them. On September 5th, reports that an accident became public, but there were no specifics or names released. Rescuers on the peak would make the following statement, at the moment, search and rescue operation is being complicated by several factors. Weather conditions, ash clouds on the slopes, rock falls, as well as ice fields on the way that can only be scaled using crampons and ice axes. The wind speeds were as strong as 15 meters per second, and snowfall would be expected to continue through most of the day. But there was finally some good news. The storm was expected to begin subsiding later in the day. On September 6th, the weather began to finally subside, and a rescue helicopter was finally able to make its way up to 3,300 meters where the three climbers were. Anastasia Yusachovov, Roman Avirin, and Ivan Alabugin were mentally exhausted. Additionally, Ivan had frostbite on his face, feet, and hands, while Anastasia and Roman were physically in good condition. The following footage you are seeing on screen is from the actual rescue on Kluchevska. The bodies of the nine deceased climbers would begin to be evacuated from the peak the following day, September 7th. One of the biggest failures after the accident was the release of information or should I say lack of information released by the Ministry of Emergency Situations. Each family member of the 12 climbers would be anxiously waiting for days, as there was no word or concrete evidence on who had passed away in the accident and who had survived. A criminal investigation of extreme time adventure would be launched a few days after the tragedy. Andrei Stepanov would be arrested and taken into custody for two months while the offices of the company were searched and officials began piecing a timeline together. The footage you are seeing on screen is from that actual arrest. The officials would also file charges against Ivan Alabugin the guide who survived the tragedy, and both men would be accused of manslaughter for the deaths of the following nine climbers. 26-year-old Andrei Kipriyanov, 28-year-old Yukaterina Kasuk, 31-year-old Alexander Zhilovacic, 34-year-old Andrei Guter, 34-year-old Maxim Solovyov, 38-year-old Pavel Selvanichev, 38-year-old Evgeny Sorokin, 41-year-old Andrei Mashenko, and 46-year-old Igor Mihailovsky. 
The case against Extreme Time Adventure came down to the preparation and experience of the guides who were hired to lead the expedition. In today's mountaineering climate, it can be easy to obtain a certification to guide on certain peaks, but that doesn't necessarily qualify a person to lead an expedition. The prosecution would bring in mountaineering experts to comb the evidence of the entire expedition, and many came back with the following conclusions. Although both guides had experience on peaks and even that particular volcano, there were a lot of mistakes made that should have never happened. Number one was improper preparation. The entire acclimatization process was rushed from the beginning, and this was because many of the members had already purchased flights back home. Number two was a failure to plan around the weather. The slopes were extremely icy, making it more difficult to climb. Combine that with inexperienced mountaineers and bad weather expected near the summit, the group should have turned around. But the most egregious mistake, which many consider to be the fatal mistake, falls on the individual who decided to rope all nine members together and failed to belay the group. Many experts claim that this mistake was criminal because the entire group would tragically pass after one climber slipped when it could have all been avoided. After the fall, there was almost no chance of survival due to the remoteness of the volcano and the inability of the rescue operation to take place. The only person who was actually officially certified, the owner of the company, Andrei Stepanov, and he was never even on the peak. In November of 2023, nearly a year after the accident, Stepanov would be found guilty of poor safety standards that resulted in the death of more than two persons through negligence and he was sentenced to four years in prison. This was an extremely controversial ruling within the mountaineering community. The tragedy that happened on the mountain not only ended the lives of nine, but it changed the lives of so many more. Many believe that Stepanov was found guilty in an attempt to prevent future accidents like the 2022 one from occurring again. There are many companies popping up promising the same thing Extreme Time Adventure did, and many of them are employing guides without proper certification. While there are some who are confident the guides on that volcano were more than qualified, there are equally as many mountaineers who think the 2022 Kulichevska tragedy won't be the last one. Let me know in the comments below if you think that court's ruling was completely justified or unfair. Thank you for watching. Until next time.